Welcome to Pop Politics. I'm Amanda Tice. Today's issue is the glass ceiling for women in politics and business. Of the Fortune 500 companies, there are only 12 women CEOs. What about the Senate, you ask? Well, there are only 12 U.S. women senators. Even more shocking is that on the 400 Forbes richest Americans list, there are only two women who are self-made billionaires, Oprah and Meg Whitman of eBay. We are here with Leah Goldman, who is the features editor of Marie Claire, to discuss glass ceiling issues that women face in politics and business. Leah is proof that Marie Claire is about being more than a pretty face and she is an expert on this subject considering her 10-year stint at Forbes. So, Leah, at home and at the office, women have made remarkable progress, but they're still not at the top. So do you think that there's still a glass ceiling? I think it's still there in a very concrete way, but what's happening now that I think is a remarkable phenomena is the massive influx of young women into the workplace in numbers probably greater than ever before. And what's happening is you're starting to see just greater numbers of women rise up right. and stick it out. These are women who were told they could do anything. Nancy Pelosi is really trying to push this Equal Pay Act and I think it is kind of helping to break the glass ceiling. How do you feel about that? Certainly there are very practical things that women still need to achieve, like equal pay for equal work. Goes without saying. But there are also new trends in the workplace that I think are helping women achieve the kind of confidence and equality that men have known for generations. And I think it's being achieved by the support structures that women are creating amongst themselves. So, you know, whereas before a woman might have felt alone and helpless given the, you know, the burdens of, of raising a family, taking care of a home, which is its own CEO act on its own. Right. So she would have had difficulties balancing that with the workplace. Now, I think you're starting to see networks of women come together and say, you don't have to do it alone. There are ways that you can reach the top. You know, mm -hmm. rely on me, I can help you out here. You can, you know, with a lot of women talk about dialing it down and then dialing it up. So what do you think are some of the biggest obstacles that, women's fa that women face in terms of this glass ceiling? It's a very interesting question, and one of the more recent findings that I'm hearing about anecdotally is the generational divide between younger women and older women. Younger women are increasingly, we're hearing, saying that they don't want to work for older women, which hmm. is a, an astonishing, if not disturbing, right. fact. And it's it, part of it is a function of they feel the, you know, the older generations are saying, I had it this tough and you need to have it this tough. And they don't understand it or maybe they're not paying deference to that generation. But for whatever reason, you know, it's it's that unfortunate cattiness that develops when women work with each other and don't support each other. It's a shame. It's a real shame. It's a startling phenomenon, hopefully one that, you know, will be obliterated just given the number of women that are entering the workplace. So in terms of women who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, are there any particular codes of conduct that they kind of have to follow? That's a great question. I mean, in my years at Forbes, I've spoken with quite a few female executives. A lot of it, like they said, was FaceTime. You know, one of the women I spoke with, oh, I read it somewhere, I read this great story about a woman, a lawyer, a lead lawyer on a big case, who on her way to the court with a bunch of other male lawyers offered to stop and get them Starbucks. And she regretted it the second she offered it, because forever after, she became known as the woman who'll get the Starbucks for everybody. And so she was running out to get the coffee while the guys were talking about their case. And it was a very interesting phenomena. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you are assumed to be the secretary. There are family, I'm sure Nancy Pelosi right. would even say that she's often been confused as the help or the secretary or the whatever in her years coming up in the political realm. Uh, those are unfortunate examples. Hopefully as time goes on, there'll be fewer and far between. Tell me a little bit about the boardroom and women in the boardroom. What should their, what, what should they be like? On a very practical level, I believe you should take a seat at the table. So if you want to be a player, be a player. Act like a player. Sit at the table. I go into countless meetings where I see women kind of lining the seats on the periphery and I find that fascinating. If you want to be heard, if you want to be involved in the discussion, then be involved in the discussion. To have your voice means you have to take those things that will let you have your voice. Obviously, you know, you want to be, you want to be respectful and you want to say your piece when it's appropriate, goes without saying. 
But being visible means being visible. Make yourself visible. Do those things that will get you noticed. That's typically how the men do it, and they don't even blink.